Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is for you. Goats. Lots of goats. This morning's Dharma talk is on the topic of the three kinds of pain, according to the Buddha Dharma. And I was going to talk about something more interesting and more romantic. But since I woke up in a lot of pain, I had pain all night because of my, I guess technically it's called a synovial cyst in my L4 vertebrae, just to include you in my end of the spectrum we call all this. This is the pain of pain. And I'm not here to one-up you. You may be in pain too. Sometimes the most difficult pain is emotional, mental anguish, anxiety, and pain. It can be extremely difficult because we can't find an off switch anywhere. Uh, physical pain is also difficult to find an off switch, although uh, those, those are being produced everywhere of different sorts uh, from various kinds of suppression drugs and so on. So I'm not here particularly to talk about something I uh, don't really know anything about anyway. Drugs, other than my own personal experience. So there's the pain of pain, which is everything from a toothache to a headache to a mental anguish over your safety or some kind of anxiety or paranoia about what's around the corner, what's going to happen next. That type of situation can be horrible. Some people actually, because of the way they're wired, the way they're, they're trained, their conditioning for the first three years, eight years, 22 years of their life, it allows them to actually receive that pain. That is appropriate. If you're hurting, you have that coming, not your ego. But this whole dynamic we call uh, body, speech, mind, this whole matrix of that appears as what? I don't know, human being maybe? If it shows up in your mind stream, if it shows up in your life stream, if it shows up in your living room, it's supposed to be there. When I say supposed to, I'm not saying there's some kind of right and wrong or supposed to be and not supposed to be. There's just dependent origination. Pratitya samudpada is the fancy word for that Sanskrit word. You have to see this. You have to see it yourself. I can talk about it. Other teachers can talk about it. The Buddha can talk about it. It doesn't mean that we're all one. We are not all one. It doesn't mean that everything is linked and hooked together in a real mysterious way that we don't see. And you need to somehow see the connections using your logic, your analysis, and so on to see the connections between everything. This is just baloney. Anytime you experience anything as other, this is ego. Until you see that there is no other, that everything is empty of your projection of it, you will continue to praise and blame. Praise and blame. I really like that. That's they're really, that's pretty good. Even this direction, you might think this is a really great teacher, or you might think, ah, oh, this teacher's, he's a, what was I called recently on a, a text or it was an email that I was a fraud. Isn't that true? Yeah. It didn't bother to point out what was behind that uh, accusation of being a fraud. You don't really need to. I am a fraud. I think that's how he used it. He's, I freely admitted that I was a lying or I was a fraud. All but. All but, yeah. Because there isn't anything that I am not. And I can say the same for you 
but I'm not asking you to agree with it. You might want to look for yourself. It's called a spiritual path. Turn to the wall, find out who you are. There's no doubt. Three marks, or not three marks, but the three types of pain. Pain of pain. This hurts. The pain of alternation, the coming and going of the pain. The way I'm experiencing that right now is uh, it's okay at two in the morning, but at four in the morning, I can't stand it. I can't stand bed. I have to get up. I have to move around and move around. I'm not here to tell you what a wonderful, courageous guy I am. I'm just saying I'm old. I'm in pain. So I'm using that, saying that's the pain of pain. And the pain of alternation shows up in the pain of pain by coming and going. And the pain of alternation can also show up as something you think you've stopped or done away with and you think you're getting somewhere and because of causes and conditions that are relentless, to use a relative approach, about continuing to uh, cash in on their ticket to ride. And what is their ticket to ride? Dependent origination, simply put. If it shows up, needs to be there, has to be there, should be there, because it is fundamentally uh, the illusion that is something separate is the problem of ego that buys into, well, that shouldn't be, or this should be, or when's that going to go away? If you realize your true nature, you don't care what happens. But that doesn't mean you're ignoring anything. If you were to fully realize what is being pointed at uh, in the Prajnaparamita or the Buddhist path, uh, the path of the Mahayana, the open way, if you were to fully realize that while well, you're still in a human form, yes, I did say still in a human form. And you were to see, receive, observe, receive the suffering of the world, you would not be able to stand up. You might not live through it. If the pain, the third one, the pain of conditioned existence came and hit you in the face. The pain of the composite, the third kind. And the pain of pain, the pain of alternation, and the pain of condition, existence, all show up each in each one in their own way, in their own specificity or uh, variability or the situational dynamic that happens in everything that is in relative truth, which makes it so difficult to understand yourself, to see with your perception of what this is, to see what it is without covering it up with your conclusions. You see it, you see it, and then you conclude. And am I saying stop concluding a little bit, but if you can just pay attention to the way you close off your wisdom mind and uh, settle for some stupid idea. Stupid is, a dis uh, is descriptive, it's not a judgment. Stupidity is just ignorance. I'm not doing too well, it's probably obvious. But coming in here is choiceless for me. The only thing that will stop me from coming in here, I don't even need to talk about. Question? Sure. Yeah. Um. I'm looking at that area of drugs and when we do leave that physical pain. Um, yeah. Drugs like ibuprofen and Tylenol, do those ignore the pain in a less um, harmful way than something like a, an opioid? Probably, you know, probably. More than likely. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I can't really go into the, I don't know how 
those things work. I just know some I can't take because of my condition, some very well-known common like ibuprofen, I can't take it. And of course, acetaminophen, everybody knows that doesn't work. You just take it because it's there and starts with an A, just like aspirin. When is it time to leave our physical pain or cover that up? When is it time to cover it up? You mean like with uh, smoking weed or something like that? Yeah, or even the acetaminophen. Yeah, just, I, I don't know. That's very individual. It's not about right and wrong. It's about being very, very aware of everything you're doing and being responsible, not blame. The ability to respond means that you have the ability to meet everything where it's at. It doesn't mean you're the praise and blame or extra. That's the relative world that is fighting all over the place. People killing people uh, based, you could say it's based on hatred, but the fundamental situation is the covering up of fear, fear of other, fear of being taken over, fear, fear. And this is, you can see it everywhere. It's all over the news media, all over the, all of the internet. And, um, well, I don't need to go into that. It's obvious if you look at it, that there's, there's an intense hatred that covers up the person who is full of hatred, who is looking out here with the, the, the phobia about otherness, prejudice. It's covering up fear. Yes. Um, an area I feel really foolish about is when you come in here in extreme pain and you don't do anything about it. And then I have pain that's a drop of what you're experiencing, it seems, and I cover it up immediately. Mm -hmm. um, how do you do that? I don't know. You're a coward and I'm better than you. <laughs> <laughs> what you think I'm doing is a projection. You have no idea what I'm doing. You have no idea. And in another way, I have no idea what you're doing, but I know what you think you're doing because you're a student of mine. So of course, I'm joking when I say that, but I'm saying you, you have an ex enough experience of living here and working with me as, a, as being a student of this person to know that I don't set up many standards. A few, we need forums, but I don't set up many. We talk about every situation face to face, we talk about, don't we say, should we, how do we go about doing this? Actually look at it for a long time before we do this. More. Is the, is there a teaching in, in your physical pain? Um, I'm not sure what you want to know. So the difference is, and I don't want to get too fancy here because then we start thinking about overthinking the whole thing, looking for something else. But the pain has its own, its, its own dynamic. Pain is just pain. Pain arises in the physical form because of causes and conditions that are, are here and have been here for what, 81 years and are going to maybe go a little bit longer. Who knows? But those are just doing, but the interaction there is just, it's so dependently risen that even the obvious parts of it are not really understood as they are there. We look at something and then we come to conclusions about it. We actually abandon the very thing we look at and it come to a conclusion about it, sometimes called a pharmacy. Go ahead. Do you have a curiosity about your pain? <laughs> Who told you that? Certainly. I have a curious, sit down and face the wall, and nothing's happening. I have a curiosity. If you're a meditator, you're practicing this particular form of meditation, of course, you're curious about everything. What is this? Who am I? What is Buddhism? Why should I even do this when I could go golfing or I could go enjoy myself, walk in the woods? I'd rather do that kind of meditation that's pleasant and peaceful and I can listen. Uh, so, and I would say you should do that too, but you should also sit down, radicalize. When I say radicalize, I mean minim, minim, minimize your activity so you're very still and you can see that aspect of the consciousness that, that keeps wanting something else, something else, something else. So curiosity, yeah, we're, cur we're curious. What is, what is the consciousness? Is uh, Vasubandhu correct in what he's saying? This is why we study Vasubandhu. 
It's why we study the 30 verses, why we study Dogen Zenji, why we study uh, Trungpa Rinpoche's writings. Jeez, I'm buying um, the, the intersection between pain of pain and pain of alternation really draws my attention. And I'm wondering, can the pain of pain arise where it's not creating the mental pain of alternation of not having been in pain and then being in pain? Simplify that. Is there ability, is there physical pain without emotional pain? Yes. What is the insight? How does one see that, I guess? Just practice. Anytime anything arises, pain, in my case, pain in my wrist or pain in my back or pain in my foot or um, all of those physical pains, uh, just that's just that. I'm not saying that you don't think, ah, oh, there that comes again or why won't that go away? There might be some of that happening, but not much. It's mostly just receive what that is, receive that verse, receive the texture of that pain. You can practice on the physical pain, but this doesn't mean torture yourself. When you sit down in front of the wall and you're sitting symmetrical and you're observing, you're practicing the instruction of just observe what moves, chicken taza, and you feel uncomfortable, uh, your back starts to hurt, you don't, you don't turn into some kind of a macho or a militant meditator where you have to some kind of success story about staying there no matter what. No, you get up. You use your intelligence as a human being. It's situational and you get up. And another person can sit there for several hours and not move at all. That is not a credential. It just looks like one. Someone sits, especially in our area here, I think Kiyun is the only one I see sit in a full lotus and he does it very easily. Does that make him very smart? Nah. Make him smart, just make him, makes him look more like a pretzel. <laughs> so I'm not saying that if you can do that, you shouldn't, you shouldn't sit that way. If it's comfortable, uh, some in, uh, in, in some countries, cultures where sitting on the ground and on the floor is more common or more traditional, more of that can happen. Like in Japan, for instance, for sure, easier for people to sit that way. Go ahead. Jeez, I'm buying one of your teachings is not to hook up the vocal cords. When I have physical pain, what gets hooked up is the storyline. Is there a way to not hook up the storyline to the pain? You mean physical pain? Right now? No, when you... Yes. No, you should just moan. I mean, you don't have to wail over something. You could use the vocal cords to, to have... So that has an expression. It doesn't mean wine and something like that, but actually, actually let the body do it what it needs to do rather than convert it into some kind of language about it. So you start to cover it up. So you actually feel what that is. Feeling is totally appropriate. You have nerve endings. Feel, feel. The, the point of, go ahead. I'm just really curious about the expression. Um, how does the expression um, help us relate to the pain or what does the expression do? Um, Moaning? Mm -hmm. It's just simple. It's just like a, like a raccoon would do it. You got a sore foot. You don't know about that? <laughs> it's very simple rather than going to some kind of converted into some kind of a, a scholarly commentary on what you should do, what you shouldn't do, why you shouldn't feel this way, and how am I going to get rid of this, and on and on and on. So I'm, I'm not promoting that. I'm just saying that that might be a more, probably is a more authentic way. It doesn't mean you're going to make a lot of racket, but just some kind of, a, of an expression of what that is. Very simple and direct. You're, you are, consciousness has uh, been uh, is showing up as a human form. And more. She is on buying. In the last few years, I've noticed that the pain working from the other direction, where um, looking more into my personal situation and research being done, that mental, emotional stress in a lot of people shows up as physical pain. So I'm wondering if there's a way we can relate to the emotional aspect of stress before it transitions into chronic physical pain. I don't know. 
I, 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 I'm tracking what you're saying, but I don't know if there's some kind of, oh, now that we see that happens, let's do this or do that. I think it's so situational, so individual with each person to, to how they're going to work with that. And it's so incredibly complicated. We totally concentrate on one area of do this, meditate this way, sit this way, or function this way or that way, all the different ways that they are just in meditation practice and totally ignore what we're eating. There's a whole body-mind complex that can't be here or that the awareness can't be here without this. And I'm not saying everybody should eat the same thing, but be very clear about, be aware of what you're putting in. There's a question from Vishal on YouTube. Go ahead, Vishal. He asks, please help us understand if there is a difference between staring and observing. Yeah, staring is more uh, an attitude of endeavoring or pushing, staring at the wall. But observing uh, may be maybe just noticing the texture of the wall. Uh, and not being stuck on that. Also, hearing the dog but just barked a moment ago, just receive that. Receive any kind of sounds, anything around you, in any of the six sense fields, including your mind, whatever rises there, just observe. So if you're uh, staring at the wall, it's uh, I don't use the word staring. I use the word observe, and I realize that's what you're asking about. And I said, it's going to be a lot softer than that. The only thing that is necessary to do is something you can absolutely do, and that's the hold still. But don't, when I say hold still, I don't, don't necessarily, even though I'm saying hold, I'm saying don't maintain it with some kind of a rigid, rigidity or something. If, you, if your body says it's time to go to the bathroom, do it formally. Bow to the wall or to the, the sangha, whatever your dynamic is, go to the bathroom and come back. Very, very situational, very respectful of everything you're not only receiving what shows up in the mind stream and in the, the other sense fields, but when the body is talking to you, listen to that body. You're not obeying it. It's just time to go to the bathroom. Or if your knee hurts, receive that. This is a misunderstanding to sit through and don't move and don't, don't take care of your body as you're sitting there. It needs to be situational, not some kind of rigid structure out of some ancient culture where men were in charge of everything, and they covered up their fear through control, controlling other people, mainly young monks, or however you want to characterize it. Pay attention to this entire form. One person may be able to sit there for four hours straight without moving. It means nothing. You know, you're not going to get any credit from me. You come and tell me that just because you can do that and I can't. I can't sit still for four hours, but some people can. They can sit down and just click four hours later, click, click, and they get up. I don't know many of them, but that also can be an incredible cover up because they're moving from uh, the state or the, 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 the attitude of receiving into the attitude of maintaining. That is not samadhi. That is also not one of the jhana states, in case you're jumping the gun on me here. Not that there is a gun. Jeez, I'm bowing. The first two pains seem to have a lot of interaction. Is there any way to look at the first pain, two pains to inform the third, the pain of the composite? Um, Maybe a little more specific, I can respond, but. How does the pain of the composite relate to the pain of alternation. The pain of the composite is uh, really can't fundamentally be seen or acknowledged, or even you have any idea of what that even is until the self-centeredness has stepped back. The, the ego mind is no longer, may still be around, but it's no longer the central authority. It's no longer the oligarch in the mind. Then one begins to actually receive the incredible suffering of the world. Jeez, I'm buying, is that pain of the composite present 
in the other two forms of pain. Yes, it's everywhere. <clears throat> Jay Zambalin, could one have flashes of that before seeing it? I think so. Seems like it. And you may have, uh, once you see it, it may show up somewhat, but it may not show up for very long because you wouldn't be able to function. Because the pain is overwhelming. One of the examples in, in that in the literature is the pain that that uh, Avokateshvara uh, or sound observer saw saw the suffering of the world looking down. And then the archetypal way of handling that is uh, the tear from this side became white tar and the tear from this side became green tar. So a kind of a way of working with that rather than put it all on one particular living teacher. She is unbowing for one who is seen through. Is that something that is present all the time or being received all the time? There is a receiving going on, but there's no receiver. So there's no keeping track of anything. So since there's no creeping track of anything for one who has seen their true nature, there is no past and future. There's barely even a present, unless it's a birthday present. That works every year, once a year. Even the late ones are okay, guys. <laughs> <laughs> on bowing. there's times where you have what you refer to as downloads. Is there any relationship between that and the pain of the composite? What do you want to know? If that's a form of the pain of the composite. If what is? When that um, overwhelming emotion arises. Yes. Thank you. You guys teamed up here? That's <laughs> Vishal again. Oh, it's Vishal. Okay, well, Vishal gets a pass. Go ahead, Vishal. Is there an extent to which I should be open, for example, fully or half? I don't know. So, Vishal, I don't really know uh, you, uh, other than a little bit uh, interaction here on Zoom and so on. So, I'm not really, I couldn't really give you a, a response that would relate directly to what's happening with you. But I would say don't do anything unless you, unless you have to. So this is a, a form of discipline that each person can actually do. If you're doing something you don't really fundamentally have to do, you might want to look look again, excuse me, look again at that. Um, the, the, the first way, the, maybe the second way, that that's showing up as uh, I think you're doing fine. Don't don't look for alternatives. Either or, either or. Too many boats get rowed away. You don't need that. Don't go anywhere. Whatever's showing up, that's it. It goes away, that's it. Comes back, that's it. Turns sideways, that's it. Turns upside down, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. As it is. As it is. As it is. As it is. Don't add, subtract, divide. Don't do any math. Unless you need to count something, and I'm not saying be some kind of horrible person that never uses numbers anymore and no longer uses language and is so removed from everything. You look like you don't know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying? Not good. Michelle has another question. Michelle. Does the back have to be pulled up like head touching the sky or can it curve a little? Yeah, that's it's your body. Yeah, you don't you don't have to stillness is important, I think, but even that, don't maintain it. You may have to you may sit still for five minutes and then need to move a little bit, another five minutes. Just return to the stillness. Don't we'll maintain it. And sit as straight as you can with your particular body and, and cross your legs if you can do a a full lotus and course and go ahead and do that. But if you have to sit with your knees pulled up, do that. If you have to sit in a chair, do that. If you have to, have to, have to, have to, have to. It's, it's your body situation rather than try to live up to any kind of a standard, whether it's 
any of the Zen forums, any of the Chinese forums, any of the Tibetan forums. I'm not saying those are wrong, but if you're listening to me, then there must be something happening here, some kind of frequency that, that I'm speaking out of and you're receiving. Otherwise, you would go listen to Dalai Lama or make uh, Adyashanti your teacher or any number of people out there in the wide, wide world. Yes. So, uh, when, when does a form that we set up become a standard? When you obey it, when you, you no longer uh, look at it and observe it as, as a form. Because that form is, is never stationary because it's not separate. But we, the ego wants safety. So it will clamp down on anything it can as a result, as an opinion, as a philosophy, as a, ju a judgment, as a, something we know. <clears throat> Someone who is realized, who just sees what this is, doesn't believe anything, doesn't disbelieve anything, doesn't ignore anything. And as other than a body mind complex being here, they're not even here anymore. Sometimes they're, uh, because the, the, the relative way of saying it, it's like they have a, a foot in both worlds. They have a foot in this world and they have a, fo a foot in, uh, uh, in the relatively spoken in the beyond or the hereafter, which there is no hereafter. It just looks that way. There's a question from Adriana. She asks, what is suffering? Something really hurts bad. <clears throat> suffering. So suffering is a distress because we want something else. So rather than actually understanding some kind of deep understanding of what is arising, we look at it and we conclude something about it. So somebody concludes something and wants something different. Simply put, just basic Buddha Dharma, life is suffering, the cause is desire, the goal is cessation, and the path is basically meditation or train your mind or Shila Samadhi and Prajna, or the, or the, the uh, eight, uh, um, what do they really call those things? You don't need all of those. That's the way it looks here. Some other teacher is going to teach right out of that totally over and over again, day after day. If you need to be there, you won't be here. I have nothing to sell. I have nothing to promise. Uh, this path looks like failure. As you, if it doesn't look like failure to you on some level, then it's not a true spiritual path. Is that a conclusion? Yep, it is. I didn't come to that conclusion a couple of years. Yes. When you're bowing, how can we receive the suffering of others, like what happened in Buffalo, what's going on in Ukraine? Don't conclude. That, that way you can actually receive fundamental hatred, fear. That young man who took those people's lives was it was it looks like he's evil and he's not from buffalo and all of the crazy stuff on the news but he's just a, an aspect of the insanity that's been rampant in the world for since the beginning of this time it just we know more about it because of the media so we know more and it's easier for that to spread uh, and infect everyone in fact anybody who has fear or has any kind of fear that they don't know what to work with how to work with that. They don't have a, a spiritual path, might not even have a, a theistic spiritual path, let alone a non-theistic one, as Buddhism is. <clears throat> so they're, they're going to look for some kind of support. And when this particular person, like all the people who go around and do something really crazy, like, like killing your own kind, killing other human beings you don't even know, that's fear, fear of otherness. Xenophobia is a fancy word for that. Fear that somebody's gonna, too many white people are gonna go down because all the uh, dark skinned people or other colored people might take over. I would say it might be a good idea. The whole lot of sanity in all the races. There's a tremendous amount of sanity, natural sanity, in people who have, who have had a, the downside of the horrible stuff that's been happening to 
people of color down through the centuries is just that. But the upside of it is a lot of a lot of deep understanding about the nature of relative truth, how deep the suffering goes. So what was your question? About how to receive the suffering of <clears throat> the world. Look at your own suffering. If you have a conflict, conflicting emotions in your own mind stream, just walking between the buildings here and out to the car, and if you're having your thought forms or your mind is coming up in terms of this shouldn't be, that shouldn't be, I don't like that, and this needs to change, or I'm going to uh, pull my money out of that account or anything, any kind of situation like that, just receive that. Don't shut it down. Don't push it away. Don't validate it. Don't disagree with it. Nothing with it. And it will show you exactly what needs to be done. It's called wisdom. Is receiving a conclusion? Um. Not if you don't conclude. If you, if you conclude you're receiving wisdom, is that what you meant? Or you often yeah. say and teach, receive, receive, receive. I teach, receive, so you can eventually see what this is. If you just receive, if you have prejudice against that, you want more of this and less, more good feelings, less bad feelings. That's the initial one right there. I want, I, I want something else. This is the, the four noble truths. The first thing the Buddha said is, life sucks. He didn't beat around the bush, and he didn't say, sometimes it's really pleasurable, but most of the time, it, no. He said, it is suffering, and it is. There's all these nerve endings, and mostly they get abraded rather than. Uh, stimulated with some kind of pleasure. Those are not separate from each other. This doesn't mean you you take that and you do like was done in the past. You take yourself away from everything, from sexual activity, from uh, eating past noon, or all the other things, shenanigans that have been going on. When I say shenanigans, not really wrong. It's like without that kind of structure, really intense, even the macho form of it, it's, it needed that to get through all the generations, decades and decades and centuries and centuries and millennia to actually still be here because this needs to be warm hand to warm hand. You have to meet a teacher. This doesn't mean you have to shake her hand. You need to meet someone who is looking at what this is. And then you need to listen to them. Don't believe them. But don't look away. She showed. So what you just mentioned, if it was a, a necessary, the macho thing was necessary for the Dharma to continue, why isn't it now? Why isn't it what? Why isn't the macho of, you know, for example, yeah. you coming here the May, you know, whatever. Maybe it is. But no, maybe it is, I don't know. So in that sense, uh, a bodhisattva who is putting others before themselves, uh, are they doing that? If uh, because of their uh, physical pain they put themselves first and not do stuff for, uh, not uh, for example support somebody else who wants to follow the form, for example. What do you want to know? Uh, I, I work, I'm struggling with the uh, responsibility of bodhisattvas in uh, putting others before themselves while observing forms. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you for clarifying that. You're doing it. I have no doubt. And everyone here is doing this or you wouldn't be here. And you're doing this in your own way. There's nothing to correct, nothing to adjust. What is there here? Just return to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Return to the three jewels. Return to the three pure precepts. Return to those forms so that you can see uh, how you conceptually may not live up to something, but it is not about living up to something. It's about awareness and the awareness of the distance between what you posit as success 
and what you posit as not living up to the form, that you need to see that structure, that duality, and see that those are not separate. This has to happen. If you're going to realize your true nature, it needs to happen in your mind stream. And I don't know whether where you're going with it, but me coming in here in pain and teaching is not macho. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not pushing on anything. Those days are gone. Nothing pushes on me. But I would say the way I would say it is just choiceless. I don't have a choice anymore. Yes. I understand that from a viewpoint of somebody who's seen through, but the bodhisattvas by definition have not seen through. They haven't. Uh, then they've got to make an effort, that's the way I understand it, yes. in order to put others before themselves. They do. So in that sense, again, back to, I think Shura was going there with pain. Uh, if I have pain and I can do other stuff, why wouldn't I show up for the form? Uh, Don't. Don't show up for the form. Always about awareness. So if you don't, if someone, if I'm misunderstanding you, any, several people here, Ashoka has a lot of difficulty with his, uh, his back and so on. So I just emphasize communication. Just let someone know. I, I know that you're, you're here because you want this kind of training. So we don't treat you like a child and you better be here. If I'm, uh, am I getting anywhere near? Uh, so I, no, I'm putting myself in somebody else who is observing or who wants to practice the forms. Yes. And they don't find the monks, uh, for example, practicing the forms. How is it helping them at all then on this, on the path? How, how is a bodhisattva, somebody, a monk who has taken a vow of bodhisattva putting others before themselves, how are they helping them uh, appreciate the forms or uh, observe the forms if they don't uh, If they don't show up? Yeah. Oh. Well, they may not be uh, as far as the relative situation, but ultimately it's the vow. It's the vow. And some people, uh, are going to take uh, a lot more time to show up uh, in, in a classical way of uh, bodhisattva activity. Bodhisattva activity, in other words, an enlightening being, someone who is inspired by bodhicitta, the mind of awakening, and is seen through the relative truth and sees there's some dynamic here that, uh, that I need to look at, need to focus on. And then you run into something like Atisha Seven Points of Mind Training, or the, the works of Shantideva, or, or uh, all, any other teachers we could mention that are, t are pointing to something that is beyond the relative right and wrong dynamic that most of the world ha has, uh, is, uh, has got itself by the throat. And it does not look good for the world. But of course, it has never looked really good for the world. So I'm just saying that each person, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm feeling like I'm not quite getting what you're saying, but I'm saying each person does the best that they can. And anyone coming here or not coming here, like if you were to say, I'm not feeling well today, no one is going to call up and just see if you're really not feeling well. It's you, it's, am I missing something? Yeah, I'm not talking about personal dilemma at all. Okay. I'm talking about the vow, a bodhisattva vow, having, putting others before oneself. Yes. There are several others who want to be on the path, who want to help themselves who want to observe forms or whatever it is. Yes. And how will somebody who is committed on the Bodhisattva path to put them before themselves, how are they helping them at all if they don't observe the forms, for example? But well, I'm going to give you a response, which I would like you to contemplate for a while. They're fundamentally not separate. So the fundamental, you're actually uh, taking a relative situation and you're squeezing it in such a way by talking about it and asking this kind of a question. And I'm seeing you're ready to actually see uh, beyond that and see that there's really, uh, there are no beings. It's empty of other, fundamentally. Yes, sir. Thank you. I understand that. I'm also wondering about, that seems to be a very fine sword. I can easily fall into apathy as a bodhisattva versus complete care. Uh, at least that's how it appears to me. Uh, is there well, so what do you mean? You're missing something there. Yeah, you're missing something. But what, when you say I can easily fall into apathy uh, other, or, or go, what would you call the other one? 
not complete care or okay. really putting, truly putting okay. everybody. So else. those are not separate from each other. And, but you were talking about at a heart level, this is very difficult to see this in an emotional heart level that, that pain and pleasure are not two different things, success and failure. The wisdom and confusion are not separate. Go ahead. Yeah, I understand it, Zopazan, again, from a perspective, I know where, I think I know where you're coming from. That's yeah. your perspective, because I just put words in your mouth, you're seeing through, so that's your perspective that no difference between apathy and uh, equanimity. But for the people who are not seen through, it is a big difference. And I somehow thought that the Bodhisattva vow is to help. Uh, others see through that difference. It is. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, everyone everyone that comes here, people who are students of mine are functioning on that path. You're talking to me, you're on that path. You're listening to me. On that path. We can talk more about that uh, in an interview if you care to do that. Good question. Thank you very much for that question. Anyone uh, want to respond to Chisho's question. You do? Oh, you're bowing. Yeah, with another question. Oh. <laughs> Is it necessary for a bodhisattva to have, well, uh, just by definition of what Chisho said, it's, a bodhisattva <laughs> hasn't seen through or seen what this is. Is that okay. a requirement to, to be able to help others? No, it is the intention. It's not the actual, you may not actually, you, there might not be some record keeper say, oh yeah, some help here, but this other Bodhisattva, you know, what a laggard. It didn't help anybody, and yet he's received this vow, and yet he, she, they don't get anywhere with it. There's no, there's, there's no record keeping of it. It's the intention. It's the intention to be with all things. It's the intention. You can start with your own thoughts. Stop killing your thoughts. The first uh, grave precept is not to kill. So start with not killing your thoughts. She is on my, in that same vein, I was just wondering if there was a possibility for an example that Chisho could ask about, and I would be happy to volunteer myself. Um, as someone who's your Dharma heir, and perhaps in forms, in the traditional forms, less than most of your students. So I was just wondering if an example would help me understand what you're asking and direct your response or provide a more direct response. So hypothetical example, perhaps real as well, <laughs> blocks it. Uh, it's clear the way you define it. Uh, invite a bell. Four hours later, invite the bell twice. And in between that is the form. And I understand, you know, if people have to get up, go, do whatever they want, okay, no, no, no issues. That is where they are on the path, and that's their capability, perfectly fine. Um, but there are a lot of people who are trying to do that as a Sangha. I'm specifically addressing the Sangha. The Sangha, there are a lot of people who are trying to do that. They're struggling. And they're they're doing whatever they're doing. I'm wondering about the role of the bodhisattva who has taken the bodhisattva vow towards those people who are struggling to maintain that form. Uh, how do they how do they manifest or what do they do in order to help those people who are trying to fill the form? Does it help them if the bodhisattva who has taken the thing also does, does it even show up for the forms? Does it help? That's my very, very specific question. Yes. It may be pretty specific enough. For yes, it does. Uh, yes, it does. Uh, it helps who? So it helps everyone. It has to, you know, it's going to have to leave the ground at some point, you show. At some point, it's, it, at some point, it's going to leave uh, your particular intellectual structure and leave the ground. You know, response for him. Would that I could say something more clearly to you that would support your understanding of what 
uh, is being what you're asking about and what I'm responding to you with. We, we, can't, uh, we can't go too far to clarify this intellectually. You have a powerful intellect. It's not a compliment, as you probably know. Uh, much more powerful than this old man. But I'm looking at what you're looking for. I'm looking at it. <clears throat> Is that some kind of bragging point? Damn if I know. But it's already complete. What you're asking about is already the case. Further? This is wrong. Um, if I go back to the same example, if not even showing up for the form is helpful, why is the form helpful at all? Then? Not. Doesn't matter whether you show up for it or not show up for it. The form needs to be there, and then you may show up, you may not show up because of the situation, of the situationality. I guess if that's a word of any situation or any person who's endeavoring to observe the form with their actual body sitting down for block sitting and another person doesn't do that the form is still there that person still needs to interact with me as their teacher around how they're working with block sitting i have students that are students but they're much more distant say than monks who live in the monastery and so i mm -hmm. i understand a little bit now but you are taking the responsibility for the form to exist. I am. Where, what is the Bodhisattva? People who have taken the Bodhisattva, well, what is their responsibility for making sure the form continues? To observe the body. This is why we do this. This is why, why there is a, I spent 37, more than that, years in, in Sanghas that did not, there were no monks. And if there were any monks, they were from Tibet or they're from Japan. We need monks here. And not just monks that are trained in Japan or trained in Tibet, trained here. So, so we set up a form. This is a very tiny little building in the middle of nowhere, otherwise known as the Midwest. And so here we are. So this is what we're doing, and we're doing it a little bit at a time. And your question is very valid. I don't know if I can get to a, a response that kind of um, fulfills uh, the questioning, uh, why is that? Oh, now I see what uh, is happening. I think it's more, um, I don't plan. I'm in uh, no person's land. There, there, there's no, I, I just meet things, not because I'm so incredibly perceptive or, um, you know, reading the tea leaves or something. I just meet everything as it is. I meet you where you are and everyone else where they are as much as I can. And I see fairly clearly the difficulty that each, each person is dealing with. And I see how much I have permission to enter into that and push or pull or uh, make recommendations and so on. And this is very true with the, uh, with the block sitting. So it is the intention when someone receives the wow, what you have, it's the intention to put others before yourself. And some of that is seeing where, where you just can't quite do that. You just can't, you're just not going to be able to do that today or tomorrow. Uh, or maybe a lot of your time is spent feeling like you're a failure at the vow, but you should return to the vow. Return to the vow, even though you're failing. It's a spiritual path. So it's, it takes a, a tremendous amount of, it's not just willpower, just intention to see the truth. Yeah. Ian. Ian Bowen. What is the problem with obeying forms? Because this is obeying a form, just blind. Uh, that uh, obeying a form uh, turns into a uh, a cult. It might be a very fancy historical lineage that is that just functions very cult like. You have to do it a certain way, or you're out of here, or you have to. You're kind of a prisoner of that form. So I'm not in favor of that. Although it can show up that way in places where there, we're still, it is still supporting the Buddha's Dharma and not particularly destroying it. More? This doesn't mean that you might not be saying to yourself, saying, I need to get to this form or that form. I need to get to the morning service. 
I missed that two days in a row. I need to get over there. So it doesn't mean that you're not encouraging yourself or pushing yourself, or maybe you're need to go and uh, sit and uh, do a block set in the morning and a block set in the afternoon because of the particular dynamic that's happening in your mind stream relative to your your family, your your business, your your partners, uh, your intimate partner, or something is happening there. You might need to do that more what strenuously, yes, but there's no obeying. Where does that effort come from? Well, the fancy word for that is bodhicitta, the mind of awakening, the, the feeling and the understanding or the insight or the inspiration that there might be something deeper to understand about being a living being. We just take this, people all over just take for granted that they're a person uh, with an Irish heritage or they're a person with with anything and they just live and function and it's, it's untrue. It's untrue. This is untrue. This is untrue. But if I just say, this is untrue, enough said, see you later. No, you need to see it. You need, I'm looking at what the Buddha pointed at. Does that make me some kind of a special person? No, it might be the opposite. I'm nobody. And so is the Buddha. No, no separate person. That can be realized. You can actually realize that. And it's an astonishing realization, which um, makes everything... Uh, unless you're in a lot of pain, uh, makes it quite humorous. Sure, going. Um, I, I feel like this is a question that helps me go into what Chisho is asking about. Um, and I'm wondering if, if it's about observing the form and we don't necessarily get to it all the time, why is it important that the form that we're observing is meditation? You mean Shikantaza? Right. Because of all the forms, that's the one, I think, because it's it's very simple, it's ordinary, it has no special contrivance. It's not like creation completion practices or deity yoga, which have their value in different ways. Uh, but the simplest one is just something that human beings have been doing forever, sit down and do nothing. Don't do anything. So we're doing it in a highly stylized way. We're sitting very symmetrical. We're interfering with it, with the casualness of it a little bit. We're uh, bringing that uh, up so that we're, so the body-mind complex is being addressed through our intention to sit still and watch the movement and eventually realize what this is. It will not be an event. It will not be an experience. If you're looking for the experience of awakening, uh, this is called spiritual materialism, which Trungpa Rinpoche talked about in his book published in 1972. Yes. Um, when we're endeavoring to observe the form of sitting, mm -hmm. <clears throat> does, when you say it's just about the intention, does the intention need to include some body observing of the form? Like, does the intention include getting to the cushion? Oh, sure. <laughs> to get to the cushion, or you can't meditate. So yeah, get get to the cushion. There's some, uh, everyone goes through a different situation, different activity, your activity, um, uh, Jiuzan's activity, different people have, people have jobs, or so there's all kinds of uh, various considerations. Of, I'm not sure if I'm getting to what you want to know. It seems like if I take the really extreme of how I'm understanding the questions that were being asked, it, it could be if we had the intention, it didn't doesn't even matter what the form we're not getting to is. Um, yeah, I wouldn't complicate it too much. Said a lot. All these forms, whether whether Russian ink awareness practice, uh, all the various <clears throat> besides shikantaza, all the other forms that I recommend, I also don't require them particularly a little bit. But it's like here's a way of working with the mind, which is I'm about to do this uh, open in the eye mind, which I've been doing for 20 years as a formal practice, and I think it's very helpful to break into the rigidity of the of the mind stream that can be. Uh, be shutting off in, in in the visual area of consciousness. We can also do that 
Russian ink awareness is also a way of relating to that in a very formal way where you can see all the things that are that are asymmetrical when you do something very symmetrical. It's about contrast. It's not about some holy practice where you're making circles or making pieces of artwork far from it. But they may look nice. You may want to hang one on your wall. But the basic thing is why we do those. You do the practice and you fold it up and put it away because it's a practice, not saving our wonderful accomplishment. Sitting practice meditation, eating orioki style, I think has some uh, is important in some ways, but more for us to understand who we are as a community. That's how it looks to me. More. Um, if we're endeavoring to observe the vow, or we've received that formally, um, does our intention to sit need to actually show up as getting to the form and completing it at some point? Well, could we need to? You need to practice. You're in a monastery. You're required to practice if you're going to live in the monastery, and if you're going to be a fully ordained monk, at least in this uh, this order, the order of immediate light, which we've created together. He was basically saying to me, "You want to do this? I don't know how much time I have left, but I have probably have some. I want to help you do this, so that when I'm gone, there can actually be a structure here where people can come and not be fed a bunch of bullshit." And yes, I mean that word. Invented words about what you should do and what you a bunch of bunch of uh, controlling kind of thing. It needs to be it needs to be controlled, but we need to do this mutually. We need to do this as sangha. It's always ignored. It's like just the followers. No, the sangha is is the whole matrix. The sangha is the Buddha. The Buddha is the sangha. The Buddha is a sangha member. The teacher, if they're a true teacher, is a member of the sangha. They're not just the overseer. That person who so-called is the, the leader or the, the Roshi or the, the Bhante or the Guruji or the Hojo-sama, that person is, is looking at what this is and the authority that arises arises just spontaneously. It isn't like, oh, this is wrong, I've got to stop that, or I need to have more of this or less of that. It's always done by looking by awareness and that which needs to be done just shows up. It's like obvious. I sometimes call it choiceless. Have you noticed that happening? So here's someone who whose 10th anniversary here is one of my slaves. When does that occur? Friday. Now you can see how what's being controlled, what's being decided. It's like a ship that's sailing and we're not sure how it even sails, but it's very, very responsive to the weather. Those, the, the sails of this particular monastery unfurl in, in, in response to the conditions, not looking for energy. The energy is already here. It's not separate from it. I don't mean to get romantic about it. Yes. Sure. How can we get inspiration from a lineage that was really rigid, but not try to em emulate that? Exactly that. That rigidity needed to be there. How do we know? Because it was there. So I could go into speculation, so could you. But it look, looks like if there wasn't some really strong, definite stuff from either Pure Land or, or uh, Rinzai Zen, Soto Zen, was Obaku, uh, uh, um, all the, the Tibetan lineages, and even the Kagyu lineages has the, the four great and the eight lesser schools that are just uh, the fundamental structure of what uh, the underlayment of that uh, incredible lineage called the Karmakagyu. So there, all this breakdown, because there's lots of different people with different ideas that are looking at the Buddha's Dharma and are, so I think we should practice this way, like we heard from uh, about Ma Machiklav Dharma from uh, Yokino, about how, how she all that she went through and how she, because of her, her understanding, her bodhicitta, her mind awakening, that maybe hadn't been totally awakened yet, but she had some kind of understanding about how you know, she needed to do this. So she wandered around in rags for a while. Ooh, there's, no way, there's no right way to do this. There's, there's no correct. But if one sees what this is and begins to see, then it's choiceless. You will, you will do you will do what arises next and that may be come in and block set and it may be go and uh, uh, 
and make things uh, in the workshop out of hopefully better wood than cedar. <laughs> it's it's really can be done. Everyone here, you're, you're, as as Coben said long ago, uh, get your own authority. Get your own, you may need a teacher. You may need a, need a, a teaching person to relate to until you can see the fundamental nature of authority. No one's in charge of this. There is no authority anywhere. There never was a singularity. Find out. Don't don't rest until you see it. Way after I'm gone, you're still around. Don't give up. We'll stop. Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. You need, I think, you might be able to do this. Uh, U.G. Krishnamurti did it on his own. Um, Ramana Maharshi actually uh, left the society and went into a cave for 20 years. That doesn't mean you have to, doesn't mean you have to do that. Go ahead, please. Yokoro. Yokoro Baling, there's a message from Eric Antaya in the uh, chat box. He says, Eric Bowing, is it selfish to focus our efforts on realizing our own enlightenment rather than trying to save others directly? Bowing. No. So my way of responding to that, and, and there's some variability here. So you might want to work on yourself so you don't take your own unexamined aggression out into the world and <clears throat> spill that over on others and have outflows that you think are their aggression when it's actually your spontaneous mirroring of their aggression. In other words, you see aggression come. Have you ever noticed somebody's aggressive with you in some way? You know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't spark compassion. Oh, poor person, you're so full of aggression and hatred with it. Put down your AK-47. No, it's too late. The causes and conditions are like an avalanche that have started centuries, what time? Centuries ago. What happened in that Grocery store happened centuries ago. This is just the culmination or the the fundamental display of dependent origination. There's no personhood there. There's no one to blame. There's no evil there. It's a credible misunderstanding to go to war with evil. If anything, you should make friends with demons. This is what Melarepa did in his cave. Have some tea. Puff, they all disappeared because they get their nutrition from conflict and from otherness and from being opposed or being disagreed with. There's a few questions on YouTube. Let me take uh, Fusan's first. How is the mirroring that the teacher does different from the mirroring that happens when like, we reflect somebody's aggression? Yeah, because there's no, there is no mirror. There isn't any, there's no otherness to it. So there's no, there's no agenda over here about the agenda over there. So it's just you show up. Uh, the mirror might look like the person, the teacher might look like someone to you. But you're looking at yourself when you're looking at the teacher. It might take you a while to see it. Jesus, how is the receiving that the teacher does a mirror? I don't know. What do you think? First thought, what do you think? I can only look at what's showing up for me as opposed to having something to blame on you or. That'll probably work. Go ahead. Anything else? Sure. Um, this question is um, after Adriana. The last question from Adriana. She she asked, "Does pain equal suffering?" No. Yeah, the three types of pain are pain of pain. Ouch! This uh, amazingly, my back pain is uh, no pun intended backed off. Well, I've been sitting here. It was pretty strong when I sat down. Um, so I don't know why, but it's not as strong as it was. Probably this real comfy thing I'm sitting on. So pain of pain, obvious physical pain. And a pain of alternation means that you're in suffering. You're suffering even though the really bad thing is supposed to happen in three days and isn't here yet. Instead of just saying, well, I'm fine right now and that's next Thursday. So instead, no, we start to freak out and worry about what's going to happen next, the pain of alternation. Something else is coming. We can't stop it or difficulty shows up and then we do something and it goes away. But then the next thing, we know it's going to come back because our records show that this doesn't go away. I 
it go, it backs off and then it comes back again and backs off and comes back again. So and what do I say about that? Receive that. Receive all of them. You get in the dentist chair, that's an opportunity for you to look at the pain of pain. This doesn't mean you should refuse Novocaine. I don't have to go to extremes about it, but you can just use that uh, um, as to see how, how that, what is the texture of that? Like you were asking earlier, the curiosity, kind of curiosity, but what, what is what is that nerve ending? How much of that has to do with the, the um, uh, production of thoughts about it instead of just receive uh, ouch or hurt or pain or that's why I say moan. It doesn't mean scream, but but go into some so you have a so your whole body is doing that, just like a child does. Children cry, and they need to. We might need to cry a little bit, maybe quite a bit. Painful. Adriana also asks, how can how can we work with the feeling of failure? The feeling of failure is uh, from the point, look who you're talking to or reflect on this. It is the path. It's, it's because it, the feeling, feeling of success is a relative uh, product of doing everything just right and getting better and improving. And it's, that's not, I'm not trying to do away with that. But if you have the feeling of failure, then you can uh, see that as, uh, as an, an, an opportunity to look at all of your stories around that and see what the intention is there. Uh, see, deeply see what that is. With the sitting practice of meditation, you'll be able to see more deeply in that, uh, into that. It's the same as a feeling of success. Not separate. See it, you need to see it. <clears throat> um, Cameron Youngs asks, when I'm in pain, I notice that I look to sustain my frustrated emotions by finding a way, finding ways to blame others. How do I work with my pain on the path when it causes me to lash out at others? So this is just everyone's doing this in some way. Some people might not use their vocal cords uh, and, and others might, but it's just, it's just an awareness practice. I don't know how long you've been sitting, but just don't give up. Return to the cushion, return to the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, or your understanding of that it doesn't have to be formally. I think it works better to do that. And I have a little battery. Maybe that's a sign. Is that a sign? The battery's getting low. She sure wants to go eat lunch. <laughs> but you need to be plugged in. I need to be plugged in. So I can take maybe maybe one final question. Yokodo, do you have a final question? Yokodo Bowing, there is a question in the chat box from Deb. Okay, Deb. Deb Bowing, is pain something to be understood? Bowing. I think so. Uh, and that's going to show up differently with each person. It's just part of being human. They have nerve endings. So pain to pain is obvious. Everybody's doing that. The pain of alternation, everybody experiences the coming and going of happiness and sadness and happiness and sadness, pain and pleasure, pain and pleasure, that relativity. And, the, and that when we're, we might be in a situation where nothing is going wrong, and yet we're really upset because we know that in three days something bad's going to happen. So uh, even animals don't worry about that. But humans are constantly inflicting pain on themselves based on that kind of dynamic that happens in, happens in consciousness. One who sees the pain of the comp composite is not separate from it. So that doesn't mean that they're uh, pain of the composite, that they're uh, in pain all the time. There's still the limitation of a human form and it stays there, but it does open up to that and see that uh, situationally. Uh, one, if you really see, as I've said before, and I'll say it again, if you as an individual being see the suffering of the world, see the, the pain of the composite, um, then you may not be able to stand up. Wulong bowing. Wulong. Um, earlier you said uh, you recognized fear behind uh, a lot of this killing. And uh, recently I was with a, a manager and we had a, an exchange and I, 
I also recognize fear and defensiveness and a feeling of threat. So when, when you recognize something, how do you not, how do you not turn that into a conclusion? What is the difference between recognizing and concluding? Bowing. There seems to be, it seems to be necessary, good question. Seems to be necessary to receive the not knowing part of it, the fear part of it, the, that texture, that brittleness, or that dark area, that cloudiness, without laying something on it that gives it some kind of permission to come into your consciousness further. In other words, trying to protect yourself from anything that might be dangerous about that, I would say, open wide and let it come in. Let, allow, receive, 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 receive everything. Receive everything that needs to. This doesn't mean eat bad food, and it also doesn't mean uh, um, overdose yourself on on uh, websites that are uh, full of hate. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that as it arises conditionally in your life, in, in so far as you can, receive uh, something that's scary rather than cover it up with opinions, ideas, um, conclusions, uh, judgments. If you can receive it as it is. And that way you may have some uh, deeper insight about the very nature of what you're receiving. And you might see that something that on the surface looks like just confusion or, or someone threatening you or being um, whatever, obstinate or whatever, that that person is full of fear. And if you receive what comes there, uh, you can also see that behind that they're, they're afraid. The, the worst bully in the world is, is full of fear. We just had a, a leader who was a horrible bully, but was is incredibly terrified of something that is coming without warning, and that is uh, death. Incredibly afraid of that. So I think I should close now. Thank you so much for your questions, and thank you for uh, uh, taking away all of my suffering. I appreciate it. penetrate into all places so that we in every sentient being together can realize the Buddha's way. O Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the Ten Directions and the Three Times, please hear us. Please come down out of the light and protect Sokokoji Buddhist Temple Monastery, our Sangha, families, friends, and visitors. Heal everyone who is unhappy, sick, or suffering and fill them with light. 